we are saying literally that the magician is doing the choice, right? And it is not. Because we then we will explore the idea that participants in our equivoc dynamic, they will have free choices. So it's not magician choice. They have free choices, but forced outcomes, which is very different, right? If you think about it, if you allow yourself to language in this in a different way, Equivoc is not magician choice. A magician choice is, in a way, the understanding of the technique, but in a very superficial level. Because if you see books about beginnings in magic or just mentalism for dummies or some, something like that, they explain magician choice in a very poor manner. And in this workshop, we will observe deeper. And as deeper we observe, the most complexities we will appreciate. And Equivoc is so complex that we need to study in a deeper manner so we can perform the procedure of Equivoc and create a simple experience, right? And sounds like a paradox, but in every performance that we do, and especially with Equivoc, we must have a complex inner reality, but a simple outer reality. So it doesn't matter how complex is the technique and how many variables and factors I will watch in. The important aspect is that the, the performance and the external actions from my inner reality are very simple, and are very playful because Equivoc has this unique characteristic that is a playful procedure. And because it's a playful procedure, we can offer it as an interesting process, right? And so again, there are different concepts. The procedure is what we need to do in order to arrive to the core method. So in this case, I need to force something, but people, from the outer reality of my performance and my interaction doesn't need to feel that we are doing a procedure. We must create a process which is fun, which is understood, playful. And, and another beautiful aspect about Equivoc is that you can engage imagination in a beautiful way. You can ask people to imagine things. You can ask people to imagine that in your hand, you hand a map, or you can imagine participant to to make playing cards float into the air, right? Or, or metaphors, and then we will see a different approach. So Equivoc, as we will study down, is not magician's choice, okay? So that's the first aspect. So what is Equivoc? And you can see the presentation that I have in here. It says, it is a procedure in which participants takes free decisions that are guided towards forced outcomes, right? So take a moment to read that again, to understand the different layers of that idea. It's a procedure, again, that we can transform into a process, right? A dynamic, a playful interaction in which participants, or one participant, independent of this context and the performance, take free decisions. The decisions, from the participant is free or the participants are free they must be free they must feel free but you are the entity that guide those words and those decisions as the forced outcome that you want that's why i did this example with the five cards right because let's say that in a very basic outcome I have the ace of spades and the king of spades. And I want to force, let's say, the ace of spades. So my participant has both cards, and I don't know the order. So I know I will take a random one. And I say, okay, let's do the final choice, the most important one, because you just have two cards. We have first five, now very simple 50-50 choice. Look at me for a moment and just feel, don't think, just feel which card doesn't belong with the other and whenever you want just hand me one in here and let's say that the participant hands you this one okay and you say why do you want to eliminate the king do you feel something okay because yeah the ace right let's say then another example and i will take the ace now 
interesting. Tell me, why did you choose the Ace of Spades? Can you notice all the non-verbal, all the verbals, and then I will, we will observe linguistic patterns that we can apply into Equivoc? And how I knew, because this card's a normark, and in the first outcome, I truly didn't know which card it is, because the peripheral vision is miraculous. <laughs> and even though I was watching the camera, if I do this, I can see that this is a king. And I never saw this, but I know because I use my peripheral vision. The same thing, I can know that this is the ace of spades. And again, I don't need to break eye contact or camera contact in this case, right? So, so many subtle aspects, but as you can see, my participant had a free decision to give me any card. But I redefine the action with a presupposition and we can go deeper into this. So another way in which we, we, as we can define equivoke is effective ambiguous communication. And I love that way. I love that way because as a psychologist, I teach different human groups how to create effective communication. How, how can we understand the dynamic of communication in order to convey our message in the most effective possible manner? But in Equivoke, we have a beautiful and, and fragile reality, right? Because Equivoke is fragile. That's why we must study it in a deeper manner. So we don't need to do it badly hopefully <laughs> and in a way this definition sounds almost like a paradox or a contradiction how can you be effective with ambiguity right and there are many papers if you are interested about communication how um, ambiguity can be truly a technique for effective communication and if you under you if you know hypnosis and you know hypnotherapy and you know milton erickson work you can see how he use it ambiguity in order to create that rapport and that relation with the patient because ambiguity is a tool that allows us to allow the participant to emerge with his or her own definition because if i say something ambiguous for example if i say freedom right freedom is an ambiguous concept can mean so many things but freedom for the participant will mean something and if i want to emerge that meaning from the participant i need to use ambiguity but in a correct manner so what is the correct manner the manner that i show you that is ambiguous verbals but confident non-verbals and it's difficult and from this moment you need to start to observe how can i embody this difficult task to be ambiguous with my words but confident with my non-verbals and if you know a little bit of psychology you know this formula right that 90 93 percent of communication is non-verbal let me say that sadly this is not completely true although it's not completely false but this uh, meravian formula was a very weak statistic so we can't say this with certainty but what we can say with certainty is this again the roots right the roots of communication is the non-verbals because imagine this i am in here with you and imagine that i have this with posture right and i am start to to wonder about the words right and i don't have confidence it doesn't matter if my words have confidence because my body, my non-verbals, my tone of voice are weak, people will assume that what I am saying is weak, right? Let's say, the, let's observe the reverse. I have a very confident non verbals but I am very weak in my verbals. People will focus into the weakness of the verbals and they will not believe or trust in me, right? So what is the 